Ukrainian drone strike hit all over Western Russia, among them Moscow, where a refinery just a dozen kilometers away from the Kremlin has been hit in the newest strikes. The strike seems to have been one of the biggest, probably the biggest Ukrainian drone strike of the war so far, but the Russians strike back and show even on video double tapping, so trying to kill as many first responders as possible in Kharkiv. We'll talk about this as well as about the developments along the front line where the recent reinforcements in the Pokrovsk area seem to already show some effect. But as said, we'll talk about this in the situation report about the war in Ukraine. In the night from Saturday to Sunday, the uh, yesterday's night, the Ukrainians struck Russia with at least 158 drones. The Russians report that they shot down 158. So we'll take this as the minimum because we do know that damage was done. But once again, they claim that shot down drones, the debris hit something and hit something on the ground. The drones, among other targets, hit Moscow. A refinery was damaged in this. And also there is a um, power plant in Ko Konakovo that was hit here that we see massively on fire in this regard as well. The Russians themselves also strike and recent attacks have hit all over Ukraine but uh, on the on the 13th of August the Ukrainian defense minister Rusem Umerov said in the US that within the last four days over 400 um, cruise missiles, missiles, drones, etc. were used against Ukraine. And yesterday, Zelensky, the Ukrainian president, said the Russians have used more than 160 missiles, more than 780 gliding bombs, as well as more than 400 attack drones. So we're talking mostly about Shahid here against Ukraine within just one week. This shows the volume of the Russians' attacks. Yesterday, among other targets, they struck Kharkiv, and they not just struck anything in the city they struck a sports complex and a shopping center and they did this during the during daylight during the day increasing the chances of civilian casualties as well but we have here a, there's a video showing the strike youtube doesn't like it too much showing this but this is already showing fire in the background and a few seconds later a second missile hits so they struck it first Cause damage forced the Ukrainians to come with first aid, with ambulances, with fire trucks to contain the damage. And then they struck the same place again with another Iskander missile to cause maximum damage on the ground among the first responders as well. That this is a clear war crime we don't really have to talk about. And striking a shopping center during the day, even if they claim that it was, it was used for military purpose, which is possible. We've seen it in the past that the Ukrainians did so. But if they wanted to avoid civilian casualties, they could have attacked at night when the shopping complex when the the um, supermarkets aren't open but they decided to strike during the day then um we, we this, this shows us that the targets are civilians among others then the russians are saying they struck in sumi region they struck a ukrainian military convoy um, according to reports they used iskander with cluster munition as well as multiple launch rocket systems the ukrainians are saying though that the strike here was a, a convoy of grain trucks so civilians farmers that were supposed to transport it a lot of people commented on it and said this these are there's like one shipping container and the rest are clear grain containers this here as far as i understand is a grain container so we see civilian trucks here in this in in a long row um there's also in the close proximity there's actually a soy soybean facility and according to the ukrainians they were on their way there to pick up soybeans. Um, this is a quite a possibility. We have here another image of the convoy just with civilian trucks being hit. But at the same time, we need to acknowledge that both sides use civilian trucks for military purpose as well. So far though, on the pictures, we see everything cons consistent to what the Ukrainians are telling us. Those are civilian trucks and they seem to be fitted for civilian transport. And as they have been on the way to pick up soybeans, according to soybeans, According to the reports, we shouldn't be surprised that we don't see spilled grain, spilled soybeans on the floor. Um, whether 
the exact circumstances we can obviously just speculate but the pictures show clear indications that the ukrainian version of this uh, of the event is the correct version uh, in Kursk region, the fighting continues. I have a map here where so far pontoon bridges have been visit have been seen. These are six. Uh, one of them here is in the is uh, covered by the map. This does not mean those six are still open. They are being attacked all the time. They are being struck all the time, and they are being destroyed all the time. But Russian mill bloggers at the same time claim that they are still able to keep up the supply of their forces in the Glushkovo pocket. We'll have to see in the midterm how, to what degree, this is true. We are talking about this region here in case um, you it wasn't clear this is a region where the three bridges over the same river have been struck uh, several of them have collapsed i think one is only only one is left standing and it is heavily damaged so more than pedestrian traffic is probably unlikely over it this forces the russians to use pontoon bridges to supply their forces in the south the estimate is 3000 the lowest estimate i've heard was 2000 russian soldiers in this area that are basically cut off from the north except for pontoon bridges the bridges that are being built are fully in range of ukrainian artillery and of ukrainian fpv drones and thus of course the ukrainian Ukrainians strike them all the time. As of now, the Russians seem to be intending to accept those losses to keep the, the supply runs open, but we'll have to see how it continues. Generally, it is expected by most observers that this region will fall into Ukrainian hands fairly, fairly soon. Other than that, I cannot confirm any change in territory. Now, currently we have a um, a geolocation that is being circled around that shows a, some new development, but it's here. It's within the region of the where the Ukrainians are expected to have been all all along, at least for quite a while. So I cannot confirm any change in territory for either side from my side. So while there are reports of attacks, both from the Russian as well as from the Ukrainian side, as of now, I cannot confirm that anything has changed along the front line. The same is to be said along Kharkiv. No confirmed changes here either. So we'll switch over right to the eastern front. And here we have the Russians in the center of Stelmachivka. Um, they have been spotted on the western bank of the Sherebets. And this is, um, yeah, this is down here. On this side, south of Pishchane, basically here southeast of Pivchane. Here we see them now confirmed on the other bank and the geolocation is more or less here. So we see the Russians are extending their foothold in the town of Stelmachivka. Um, whether they have full control over it as of now or not, I'm not able to confirm. Russians are claiming that they took the town, but as of now from the geolocations itself, I cannot confirm that the Ukrainians definitely do no longer have a presence here, but we see extended control of the Russians in this area. We go to the south of the Sibirsky Donetsk, the river here. Uh, attacks are being reported in the direction of Siversk, but no change here. But we do have a change in Chasivyar, and that is unpleasant for the Ukrainians, as the Russians have crossed over the canal again, or they are still over the canal. That's not 100% sure whether they still had presence here. But now we see them further down in Chasivyar. We see them roughly, yeah, roughly here at uh, this point. So far, we've only seen them roughly here. I think it was here and here. So now we see they are at the very least back on the western side of the canal in Chesivyar, or they have been there quite a long time, but they also extended. So we have not seen them in this area yet. We hadn't seen it before, but now they are there, showing that they extend their presence on the western bank of the canal in the Chasif Yar, uh, in the city of Chasif Yar, after having taken the canal district. Now they've crossed over and they are gaining ground inside of Chasif Yar. Slowly though, but still they are gaining ground. The further south, we have the Russians claiming that they took Pivchane. We see that here on the deep state map that uh, they are attributing the southern area to the Russians here, but also Pivchane should be this region up here. Uh, according to 
what I said in the last situation report, I think that Drushba is probably under Russian control as of now. So it's likely that this area is under Russian control as well. I have not seen geolocations though, whereas in Drushba, I've seen the Russians being at least here. So making it very likely that all of it is taken. In this area, I cannot remember having seen any Russian presence in the last week or so. So this I cannot confirm. I cannot confirm that the Russians actually took Pivchane, but they are definitely close. So it's possible that the Russian Ministry of Defense is saying the truth here, but we've heard that before that they claim some gains that they didn't take. Further west, we have additional advances in the Pokrovsk, Pokrovsk uh, region here. We have the Russians uh, attacking in Mikhailivka in the direction of Seli Dove. We have an engagement that was filmed that is happening here. So outside of the confirmed control by the Russians so far, and this this was filmed here. Interesting part is that this was uh, here the brigade from the National Guard that was just redeployed towards the region region was already engaging the Russians and causing significant damage. A tank of the brigade crushed, uh, destroyed a Russian BTR-82 and the infantry accompanying it was also destroyed in this context, showing us that they are already operating there. They are also already pu uh, publishing drone footage of their strikes against infantry. So we see them already showing some effect in this region. The Russians are still advancing though, they ha have taken Dulinivka. We have a geolocation of this in uh, the, this is down here. And here we have the Ukrainian, the, the Russians inside of the town of Dulinivka. Whether the, the, um, the Russians have recently been here in the northeast of Halitsinivka, now we do know that they control Dolinivka as well. So the Russian advance towards the south of Kalinove is continuing fairly rapidly. The clear target here is obviously to close this and take over the area here, cause uh, force a turning maneuver, force the Ukrainians to withdraw from that area to straighten the front line and securing their flanks of their advance towards Pokrovsk. Further south, there is a change at Vuledar and this is also bad news for the Ukrainians because the Russians have reached the mine to the northeast of Vuledar. This is basically the mine that gives a reason for Vuledar to exist at all. This is the mining town that operates that mine and the latest videos have shown the Russians reaching that point. Uh, as of now, the Russians are claiming that they gained a foothold, whereas the video does not fully confirm that from pro-Ukrainian sides. We have the admission that the Russians reached it, but the question is where they forced to withdraw or whether with uh, where they destroyed there this is unclear yet it's possible though that the russians managed to gain a foothold in it and this obviously would extend their control in this direction and increasingly putting up uh, increasing the the pressure on the town of vuledar as well that has held out against russian attacks for roughly two years or over two years as of now Further west, we have no change in territory, but an interesting video that has popped up. And uh, here in the direction of Mirne, a video is showing a Ukrainian drone dropping some uh, burning material. This is being being uh, called thermite. I'm not 100% sure if this is really thermite. And then some claims is this is to basically use it as a defoliant to get rid of the green areas, to burn down areas where the Russians use it for their coverage. Other claims are that this was meant to attack the Russians that hold positions in here. We see that a fire has started. So this is a new development that drones basically work as flamethrowers here. This in itself is already remarkable. The interesting part is where it was geolocated and that was here. We see here Mirne and we see this like a river and uh, this here, the two hooks of the river, of the, the foliage here. And south here, this is the river. These are the two hooks. The, the video was taken here. So this is supposed to be two kilometers away at the very least from solid Russian control, probably almost four kilometers away from Ukrainian positions, if we believe the deep state map here. But the Russians, the Ukrainians use, use it to attack something there and they use it to burn down trees. 
this could be meant could be could mean a couple of things either the front line is closer than we were we were expecting or they expect for instance artillery in there mortars could be in this in this area um, there could be self-propelled howitzers or any, any something like this but anyways an interesting development especially with a switch to basically flamethrower thrower thrones uh, drones, I'm sorry, <laughs> flamethrower drones in this area. From the Crimean Peninsula, the Ukrainians are reporting that they used their uh, Palyanitsia drone against it as well, or cruise missile. It's probably a uh, yeah, cruise missile is a better description. This is the new weapon the Ukrainians have developed to strike in the russian rear uh, the informations are getting bigger there are rumors a lot of it but now the claim is that the warhead is roughly 20 kilograms so not too big but the range is supposedly roughly 700 kilometers in this area and as it's jet powered it's much faster than the usual drones and thus has a higher chance of hitting this was supposedly used for the first time on the crimean peninsula the ukrainians are reporting that it was successful and that it destroyed its target I cannot say which was the supposed target and I cannot say whether the attack was successful. It's just being reported in this context. From the, to talk about the general situation, we are switching to an article from The Telegraph and they are saying that um, the situation at Pokovsk continues to be critical, not much of a surprise here. Um, they are saying that the Russians have an, a superiority in 5 to 1 in infantry and that the Russians uh, are also having deploying powerful electronic warfare. Often they have to use 10, 12, 15 drones just to destroy one tank only when they are lucky and destroy the electronic warfare. Um, the, the tank with the electronic warfare first is the chance higher. Also, the Russians are still superior in artillery and in other regards, they are not much of a surprise here. So the situation remains bad for the Ukrainians. But at the same time, the, the brigade that has been freshly redeployed to Pokrovsk is already showing its effect. The, a couple of videos already show the damage they are doing to the Russian attackers in this context. And at least for now, it seems that the advance has been slowed down. Down. We'll have to see. Um, another ar interesting article, by the way, by the Wall Street Journal is talking about Pokrovsk. And here it's the report is that half of the miners, up to uh, 4,000 miners are still working there. And a big part of them are now being used to build fortifications. So we, we should expect that uh, the field fortifications in Pokrovsk are growing massively. The talk is even about four different lanes of for, the, for the defense here. We see that the Ukrainians do their best to create the circumstances to be able to continue defending Pokrovsk for quite a while, as we should expect right now that the Russians will probably reach it within this year and the fight for Pokrovsk will start fairly soon. But then again, the new brigade being sent here seems to already slow it down. It's a little too early to say that. Tomorrow we might wake up to another three kilometer advance here but for now at least it seems that it had an, Im an immediate effect in this area. Then uh, the Ukrainian Defense Minister Umarov said that uh, there are still Russian jets in the range of attackers in Russian airfields, but by now the Russians have withdrawn 90% of them. And uh, the Sukhoi 34, which are the gl most used glide bomb carriers, are completely withdrawn from in Storm Shadow and attackers range, again showing that Western. Uh, deliveries of weapons might now happen but the restrictions they are setting upon the Ukrainians are crippling their war effort and are basically protecting the Russians and their glide bomb carriers while while forcing the Ukrainians not to attack the target that is dangling in front of their nose. We'll talk about uh, troop generation as well and here we have the report from Bloomberg that unfortunately I was not able to access this article otherwise but um, they are saying that deliveries from ballistic missiles um, of ballistic missiles towards Ukraine, towards Russia, is imminent. They expect it to happen within the next few days. No information yet about the volume and the type of missiles, but it's likely that Russia will receive short range missiles in exchange for the air defense and systems and the electronic warfare systems they have recently given to Iran in preparation for a potential war with Israel. And there, in a war with Israel, the short range missiles would be useless unless Iran wants 
to strike US bases around the Gulf and the Gulf states. And that would probably not be a smart idea unless they want to draw the Gulf um, Cooperation Council and the United States in a war against themselves at the same time while they might fight Israel. So in general, they would have a sizable arsenal of short range missiles available that they can't even use against Israel. And it is expected that uh, that Russia receives a fair amount of those. And as ballistic missiles are hard to to defend against for the Ukrainians, this obviously is very bad news. Then we have a survey from Russia, the Levada Institute has uh, has um, asked the Russian population a, a certain amount of them, obviously a regular survey institute. Now the Levada Institute is being considered to be independent, so their results are more or less trusted in the West. And according to them, 78% of the population supports Russia's war in Ukraine. 43% um, of them definitely support it and 35% rather support it. So the Basically, four out of five Russians support Russia's war against Ukraine. This is um, quite a significant number and shows again that this is not Putin's war where a dictator is forcing his country into a war, but this he can rely upon the wide support of its population. Turkey has uh, asked to be accepted in BRICS where Russia, Russia is a member. They want to um, set themselves up on a wider basis worldwide, uh, apart from their traditional Western allies. Obviously, this um, causes some consternation in the Western capitals, as, as Turkey wants to basically join a, an organization where Russia and China are dominating. Um, but yeah, this is Turkey's foreign policy developments. Armenia at the same time has suspended all cooperation with the CSTO. This is was is sometimes being called Russia's NATO. Um, the CSTO has obviously abandoned Armenia when it was attacked in September 2022, where Azerbaijani troops ent entered Armenia proper, not just Nagorno-Karabakh, not just Artsakh, but the proper internationally recognized Armenia was entered by Azerbaijani troops. Armenia's uh, prime minister asked for military aid from the CSTO and they sent two officers as observers as Russia wasn't even, even if it was willing to, it was not able to as all its armed forces, this, the, the, those that could have helped Armenia were fighting in Ukraine. And now Armenia is going towards taking um, the consequences from this. Russia, um, there's also reports that Russia increasingly is relying on gold, physical gold for its foreign trade as more and more banks start to refuse cooperation with Russia in, in international trade. So physical gold has to be transported around now to pay for international purchases. Um, this shows that the foreign the, the foreign, especially the US-led sanctions are showing their effect. The question will be, is Russia able to continue paying with gold? There, of course, the gold mines run by Wagner in the past in Africa play a big role as well, as they pr are one of the sources for physical gold. Russia itself has a big mining industry in gold as well, though. And in international support, we have news. The Netherlands are delivering 28 BVS-10 Viking. These are the um, Heglunds, basically. We have them here. Um, this is an armored all-terrain vehicle with high mobility, um, protected against small arms and splinters. Um, it, I think it's amphibious too. It's perfect for the Rasputitsa. Like in, in its mobility, it's one of the the best, one of the most mobile vehicles. Uh, Ukraine already received a couple of them from various nations. I think Finland has donated Sweden, Germany and others probably as well. And now 28 more of them are coming from the Netherlands. But that was it from me for now for today's situation report. If you enjoyed this, please give it a thumbs up. It really helps with the algorithm. Leave a comment in the comment section. What do you think about the current developments? And if you're new here, I would like to invite you to subscribe to the channel and hit the bell icon so you don't miss future videos. Um, this channel is only possible because of the support of viewers like you. If you like to support the channel, you can do so by the means in the description. But that's it from me for now. Thank you for watching and I'll be back.